Hello, we're glad you've joined us for this webinar, Next Generation Sequencing of the Immune System from Single Cell to Bulk Repertoire. I am Michelle Ashton of Labyrinth, and I'll be moderating this session. Today's educational web seminar is presented by Labyrinth, a leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars advancing scientific collaboration. It's presented by Beckman Coulter. To learn more about our sponsor, please visit www.beckman.com. Let's get started. You can post questions to the speaker during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the drop-down box located on the far left of your screen labeled Ask a Question and click on the Send button. Questions will be answered after the presentation. To enlarge the slide window, click on the arrows at the top right-hand corner of the presentation window. If you experience technical problems seeing or hearing the presentation, just click on the support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by typing it into the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credit. I now present today's speaker, Miranda Burns-Steele, the Director of the R&D and Operations at iRepertoire, Inc. To learn more about our speaker, please visit the Speaker tab at the top of the presentation window. Miranda, you may now begin your presentation. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank my friends at Beckman Coulter for the invitation to give this presentation. Over the years, iRepertoire has increasingly incorporated Beckman reagents and robotics into our workflow, which has really improved our sensitivity, inclusiveness, and repeatability. So today I'm going to explain how iRepertoire's technology can be used to capture really important information from the body's immune system, from the single cell all the way through immune repertoire analysis. So the the immune system is at the forefront of environmental and genomic interactions. And the adaptive immune system, specifically the B and T cells in the adaptive immune system, can actually rearrange their genomic DNA so that they can mount very specific and rapid responses to environmental challenges. I really like this picture because to me it points to the balance the immune system has to achieve in order to get this measured response. So for instance, when an organism encounters an external threat like a virus or a bacteria, if the response is too strong, inflammation will result, which can result ultimately in tissue damage. If the response is under responding, then the organism can succumb to infection. Likewise, we're constantly challenged with internal threats, uh, damaged cells, damaged DNA, damaged proteins, and the body has to be able to recognize these, but if the body over responds to these threats, we develop autoimmunity, which ultimately results also in tissue damage. Or if we under respond, we can develop cancer, which is out of control cell growth. Okay, so iRepertoire since 2009 has been developing multiplex PCR technologies that capture the variable gene region from B and T cell receptors. The receptor, whether it's a B or T cell, is a heterodimeric protein that is on the surface of the cell. Or in the case of B cells, it can actually be excreted into the blood plasma. It is comprised of two chains, two different chains at the surface of the protein, whether it's a T cell receptor or a B cell receptor. One of the chains is more complex, consisting of a diversity segment, a V diversity segment and J region, and the less complex chain, which consists of a VJ rearrangement. It's together that these two chains form the actual receptor, and it's important to note that at the RNA level, these two pieces of information are actually not connected with one another. The variable region that we target is generated from the recombination event at the genomic DNA level of one V gene from many options, one D gene from additional options, and one J gene. And together, these can be combined with various constant region genes. 
Here I show a B cell receptor, but there's actually a similar recombination re event on the T cell receptor. Additional mechanisms increase the diversity of the DJ rearrangement site, such as N addition and nibbling. And with B cells, the heavy chain can undergo a process called hypermutation across the entire variable region. This makes it important to capture that variable region so that you can capture these hypermutation events, which can further increase the binding of the B cell receptors to the actual target. At iRepertoire, our coverage of the variable region is compatible with Illumin and Next Generation sequencing and is perfectly sized for many of the kits offered through Illumina. We have short read kits which capture just the CDR3, so they begin with in framework 3 to the beginning of the C gene. Our long read kits in mouse capture from within framework 2 to the beginning of the C gene. And our long read TCR and BCR kits for human capture from within framework 1 to the beginning of the C gene. And importantly, in B cell receptors, we are also able to capture the isotype information in addition to hypermutation events. Okay. So when I talk about single cell, what do actually I mean versus bulk repertoire? And why is single cell so important? I alluded to it on the previous slide when I said that the protein at the surface is a heterodimer composed of two different chains. But when we think about the cell and the way we normally handle cells, we break open the cells or lyse them and all of the contents spill into the vesicle. At that point, I have a huge loss of information problem. I no longer know at the RNA level which receptor of the heavy chain is matched with its light pair. Or on the T cell receptor, I no longer know which alpha is matched with each beta or each delta with each gamma. So in order to get that information back, if I think of single cell as a piece of fruit, I can, if I treat each cell as its own, in its own reaction, I can actually call the heavy and light chain pair or the T cell alpha and beta pair. Additionally, I can actually start to delve in depth into the actual cell and start to tell you, is it a kiwi? Is it a raspberry? Is it a blueberry? Meaning I can actually call the phenotype of each single cell. Whereas when I do bulk repertoire, bulk repertoire has a lot of in information about diversity. However, I can no longer tell which heavy chain matches which light chain, which alpha matches which beta. And uh, that can be important if you're planning to do functional assays downstream. Right. So in order to address this issue, we've developed a service that co-captures the B cell receptor heavy and light chain or the T cell receptor alpha and beta chain from single cells in 96 well PCR plates. And this service is called iPair. Um, it's based off of our Amplicon rescued multiplex PCR technology where both receptors are co-amplified in a single cell which is deposited into a 96 well plate. So briefly, I'm going to go over the features of the iPair service. So there's a couple of options that um, our clients will use when sending us cells. They can either sort, bulk sort the cells at their site and send to us and we will single cell deposit into iCapture plates. But if they have very few cells, um, and they're already doing the sorting experiment, many of them will actually take their cells and an eye capture plate on site and they'll single cell deposit at the time of sorting. They send us the plates or they send us the cells if we're gonna actually do the single cell plating. And we perform the Amplicon Rescue Multiplex PCR technology and I'll go into the details of that in just a second. However, as an overview, we perform reverse transcription in PCR1 in 96 well format we then index each well of the PCR plate during PCR2. We perform a cleanup. The libraries are pulled together and they're sequenced using Illumina Next Generation sequencing. The data is mapped and reported in what we call the iPair analyzer. And the iPair analyzer really helps and facilitates the viewing of the particular alpha, beta, VDJ rearrangements in each well and thus each single cell. So how does this work? So as I mentioned just a moment ago, it's based off of Amplicon Rescued Multiplex PCR. It's a nested, meaning there's outside and inside primers, reverse transcription PCR. Included on the inside primers is an inline plate barcode, 
which we use to actually barcode multiple plates. So we can stack multiple plates into the same sequencing run. Now, we use RNPCR in bulk repertoire. We made some modifications for single cell. We modified the primer set so that both loci, alpha and beta, can be amplified under the same conditions, or Ig heavy kappa lambda under the same conditions. So they're co-amplified in the same well. They're co-amplified under low reaction volume. And we swapped out the adapters so that they were compatible with Illumina dual indexing, because this dual indexing is what's going to allow us to map back to that individual well of the PCR plate. So as I said before, we're performing Amplicon rescued multiplex PCR. And we're actually doing this with a reagent called Spry Select Beads from Beckman. So what we do is we perform the reverse transcription PCR1, and we rescue that entire bead product using Beckman Coulter Spry Select Beads. These beads are then brought into PCR2, which I'll go over momentarily. But before I do that, I want to show you an experiment as to how much these beads can actually increase the amplification sensitivity. This is an agarose gel image, and the band at about 500 base pairs, this nice bright band on the right, is the band that we want. This band on the bottom at about 180 base pairs is actually called primer dimer, and we don't want that. So all of these amplicons came from the same RT-PCR1 product. In the first two, we just transferred two microliters of PCR1 product into the second PCR. We did no SPRI-B cleanup in between. In the middle portion of the gel, we had an unoptimized SPRI-select protocol. And finally, at the, at the end of the gel, we have the optimized version. So all are starting with the same template, but as you can see, you get dramatically different results. By increasing the sensitivity of the bead selection, we're actually able to increase the number of successful VDJ calls that we get, and thus we can increase our pairing alpha, beta, or Ig heavy capital lambda success rate at single cell. So we also incorporated automation into the processing of these 96 well PCR plates. I don't think I have to tell many people that it's kind of a bear to process a 96 well PCR using a multi-channel pipette. Um, not only is it time consuming because you have to, if you're using an eight strip or a 12 strip, but it also is error prone. So one of the features we liked about Beckman, there were several features, but the first is that it had a 96 well head and so that we could process all wells at the same time, thus de decreasing the actual amount of time that it takes to process the plates. We also can decrease the reaction volumes because we're able to accurately process each individual well, go down to about three microliters. We can avoid cross-contamination, and we can reduce our consumable usage by uh, reusing our tips. This has resulted in very consistent results. In the next slide, I'd like to, or in the next slide, I'd like to show you a little video that shows some of the features um, of the actual robot that we have in hand. It's a bi Biomech i5. So we'll show the robot now in action. Okay, so the video showed some of the functionalities of the i5 robot, and I do feel that the movie does speak louder than a static image. Um, so you saw that the robot was capable of low tr volume transfer, and we were able to mix the beads with the PPR, PCR products using a pipetting uh, very efficiently. But 
for me, one of the important features is that we can actually reuse those 96 well tips, really reducing our consumable costs. Because if I'm going to use those tips again for another wash, I can actually just tween wash them and put them back into their original slots, uh, which allows us to basically cut down from you needing 10 boxes of tips if we were doing this manually to one box. Um, and finally, I thought the gripper arm was really cool because it's capable of picking up non-skirted plates. And we like these plates because they're divisible, so we can actually score a portion of the plate and test on a portion if we'd like to before beginning the entire processing. So after PCR1 and Amplicon Rescue is completed, we then proceed to PCR2. So during PCR1, our primer sets had this partial handle, partial adapter sequence included on it. So the PCR products have this handle. We can then pick up the PCR1 product with a pair of primers. Um, this pair of primers is going to have the alumina dual index, indices on it, an I5 and an I7 index. And if you think of this kind of like a map, that's the best way to think of it. So if we're in well C2, that would have index 503 and 702. This means that anything that's amplified in that well will have that index and can thereby be traced back to that well. And in this way, we can trace back from one single cell, the alpha VDJ, the beta VDJ, to the same address or B cell looking at the Ig heavy and the kappa lambda at the same address. Um, this also allows us to look at phenotype, which I'll talk about in a couple of slides, where we can actually add markers, additional gene markers, so that we can start to tell what type of fruit is it. Is it a kiwi? Is it a strawberry? Is it a raspberry? So we can add these directly to the reaction and co-amplify them with the alpha and beta sequence or with the Ig heavy and kappa lambda sequences. So one of the more difficult aspects of developing this service was actually establishing cell handling and shipping conditions. Um, because a lot of immunologists usually have very few cells. We're talking when the cells are sorted, sometimes as few as 1,000 cells, sometimes it's a few hundred cells. Um, typically, on average, I would say between five and 10,000 cells. However, you can't cryopreserve 5,000 to 10,000 cells without losing a lot of them, and it's really not recommended for less than a million cells or 10 million cells even. So we had to come up with a way that we could have cells shipped to us for single cell plating and iPair analysis. And we found a reagent called Kyogen RNA Protect Cell Reagent. It's sold through Kyogen. And we developed a proprietary method where we could actually detect intact cells from de cell debris and plate directly, single cell plate directly from that reagent. So in this experiment, we have 500 cells that have been placed into 400 microliters of this reagent. And we just stuck it in the refrigerator for eight days. And we were mimicking shipping conditions in a four degree cooler. So we took the cells out of the refrigerator. They're jerkat cells, meaning they have one alpha and one beta sequence, so a very consistent sequence. And we plated these. Um, these 500 cells, one cell per well, and we co-amplified the alpha and the beta. And this is this amplicon at 500 base pairs in the middle of the well, and each well is one single cell. And you can see after eight days at four degrees, we still have 100% amplification success rate. So as I said before, we have a lot of people who really want to know not just what the VDJ rearrangement is for the cell, but actually what is the cell doing in its environment. To address this, we have two different types of technology to answer what type of cell it is, and I'm going to go over the benefits and the cons of both. Um, first, we developed a gene-specific panel. These are primer pairs that cover the targets in the left-hand side, those gene-specific panel. There's up to 30 targets, and not all 30 targets have to be analyzed at the same time. These can be custom made from anyone on this list. The benefit is that of these is that you can add these primers to the alpha beta VDJ amplification, the RT-PCR1 reaction directly. So the alpha, the beta, and these phenotyping primers can be added all, on, all together and co-amplified, which makes for less expensive processing. The bad part about this is if one of those markers is actually overexpressed in the cell, what will happen is that that marker will get the majority of the reads, which can lead to actually dropout on the VDJ, increasing expense if you need to increase the sequencing depth, 
and it's not predictable because each cell is its own template. So each cell, we, we don't know a priori what the actual expression is going to be, what the expression profile is. So we therefore developed another panel, which actually allows for more targets. It's called an oligo-DT panel. And instead of doing the reverse transcription with the immune-specific primers, we actually start our oligo-DT panel with reverse transcription from an oligo-DT primer. We then split the amplification into two plates. One plate goes for VDJ pairing, just like I showed before, and the other plate actually has a primer mix that covers various gene markers up to 100 um, so that these can be analyzed independently of the VDJ. Therefore, the sequencing can be performed independently of the VDJ, uh, which actually helps reduce dropout on the receptor pair. So, in order to view the results, we also developed a GUI called the iPair Analyzer. And I'm going to spend a few moments talking about the iPair Analyzer because it will come up again later in the talk. And when you first open it, you get a full plate view. And the colors on the plate actually demonstrate the genes that are expressed. So, if a well is blue only, it means a TCR alpha was called. If it's purple, a TCR alpha and beta. And if it's, if it's red, um, a TCR beta. The same color scheme can be performed with Ig heavy kappa lambda. Any of these wells, you can click on the well, so in this case it's clicked here, and you'll see a report of the CDR3, that's where the DJ rearrangement is, that's the translated amino acid of the TCR alpha and the TCR beta. If I click on these, I actually get a view and it searches the entire plate for that particular pair. So if there is clonal expansion, meaning one clone is actually dominant in the sample, it will show up on the plate as multiple instances of a circle and a diamond um, that overlap. So maybe this well, if it had a circle and a diamond, would be an instance of clonal expansion if it showed up more than once on the plate. But also below, you get it to build your own table for those targets that you want to go on and clone and express for functional studies. So you can look through the plate, clear the table, actually build the plate with, build the table with only those wells of interest and then export the read information for those wells for downstream cloning and expression. For iPair Plus, we also offer heat maps and TISME plots so that we can look at the relationship of the genes and the various cells. So now I'm going to actually show you an example that's really exciting of the development of the first human monoclonal antibody um, against Plasmodium falciparum PFS-230 antigen. So this story was really interesting. I, I was not aware of what transmission blocking vaccines were until Dr. Kohela called me on the phone um, asking for help with a project. Her timing was perfect um, because we had just completed the actual R&D necessary to release iPair B-cell receptor um, single cell analysis. So transmission blocking vaccines are very interesting. Um, they prevent transmission by the blood meal from which the, the malarial infected mosquito eats you. So if the mosquito bites you and sucks in the blood and you've been exposed to this vaccine, you develop neutralizing antibodies against that plasmodium falciparum. And when the mosquito intakes that blood, it actually can kill the malaria in the gut of the mosquito. So they were actually looking to identify the B cell receptors of very rare memory B cells from, um, from adults who were administered this vaccine and showed responsivity to the actual plasmodium falciparin antigen. So these adults had received four vaccinations and uh, Camilla was able to identify upwards only like 50 to 100 memory B cells, antigen-specific memory B cells, um, out of 5 million PBMC. So obviously she needed a way that she could look at the receptors of these 50 memory B cells that she was finding per patient. And originally she was going to use bulk repertoire, but luckily I convinced her that it was worthwhile to do single cell. And we performed the single cell experiments. And for the first time I had ever seen on B cells, that we had clonal expansion of 
different B cells on the plate. So we might have one clone that shows up three times, another that shows up two times, um, another that showed up two times. So we started to see these clonal expansion of B cells, which I'd never seen before, because usually primary B cells are very, very diverse. Um, and these cells were very, very rare. They were 50 out of 5 million PBMCs that she was pulling out of these patients. So in her case, she single cell sorted at the time of sorting, she single cell plated, and sent us the plates and we performed the IPR BCR on those plates. Well, obviously our next question was, well, are these actually reactive against the uh, plasmodium falciparum antigen? And we did a very quick in-house at iRepertory, we did a very quick uh, reverse transcription and translation and made fab fragments for five of the selected targets based on clonal expansion of the different B cells. And what we demonstrated was that at least four out of the five or 80% of them were actually binding to the, to the antigen. So at NIAID, they went and made a full-scale antibody for two of the top or the most dominant clonally expanded B cells. And what they found is one of these um, antibodies actually can eliminate 99% of the um, gametocytes and the, the various forms of the plasmodium falciparum um, at, at low concentration of protein. So it's very, very exciting and that work should be coming out soon. So one of the biggest um, issues with obviously doing a low throughput service like this is that you can only analyze 96 cells at a time. Now this is fantastic if the cells are very rare um, or you have a way to pull down the specific antigen specific cells of interest. However, if we want to analyze more than a few thousand cells, we need to go to a higher throughput method. So I'll also introduce our high throughput single cell pairing and phenotyping service that we're developing based off of the BD Rhapsody. So the BD Rhapsody is an interesting cartridge based single cell system. It has micro wells where you can load single cells in the micro well, and one cell per well is loaded with one barcoded bead. The cells are lysed, the RNA is captured onto that bead, and then the beads are all transferred into one small Eppendorf tube, and the uh, RNA is reverse transcribed, such that each bead, and therefore all of the RNA, will contain the same barcode on that bead. The beads are reusable. This means that we can actually perform an alpha amplification, a beta amplification, a phenotyping amplification, all from the same bead set. As long as we capture the cell barcode during sequencing, we can trace all of that information together. So this allows, so the BDJ pairing is through our own proprietary strategy and technology, but we're using the BD Rhapsody kits in order to, and their beads in order to get this cell barcode information. Um, this also supports simultaneous RNA and protein measurements, so you can actually add proteins that are labeled with an oligo DT tag, or a poly A tag, I'm sorry. And, um, but we haven't explored that option yet as we were developing the TCR alpha and the beta. So from some of our initial experiments, this is one initial experiment, where we're looking at monocyte depleted CD4 positive cells. We loaded 15,000 of those cells. And we were in the end able to identify 9,000 barcodes from eight different amplification replicates on the beta and 12 different amplification replicates on the alpha. We averaged 9,000 TCR beta CDR3s and 6,000 TCR alpha CDR3s to identify a total of 2,652 pairs from those um, 9,000 cell barcode. Some of our initial experiments were for validity. So what we would do is we looked at the actual BD data because we have phenotyping data and we also have our BDJ data. So looking at each chain individually, if we're looking at um, the TCR beta CDR3, and we look at the phenotyping data from the BD400 gene kit, the BD constant region gene should overlap with the VDJ of RTCR beta CDR3. And indeed, we do find that. 
and we also can see a population that we're missing. It's the same with the CDR3 alpha. We can look at the alpha CDR3. We can look at the constant gene from BD's kit for the TCR alpha, and when we combine them, we can see where they overlap and the various populations that we're missing on the VDJ calling for alpha. And it actually turns out that alpha is the one that's limiting our ability to pair the various VDJs. If we looked, look at the paired alpha and beta, so we were looking in the previous slide at individual beta chain and alpha chain. Now if we look at the coincidence of the alpha and the beta, this is the BD alpha C and beta C. These cells have the alpha C and the beta C from the phenotyping panel. And here's the paired alpha beta. So there is a portion, a subset of cells that we are not calling the paired VDJ. And we're still looking into that. But that will be coming soon as a service so that you can analyze upwards of 20,000 cells as opposed to looking at 96 well plates. Okay, so I have to mention here that single cell really taught us a lot. Um, it taught us a lot about amplification and about our techniques and about sensitivity. Um, and from our single cell experiments, we actually developed a new type of PCR called dimer avoided multiplex PCR. And specifically, we've started to apply this to bulk repertoire amplification. So looking at all of those cells in the, all of that RNA in the smoothie using this new technique. So this is a single cell gel, and this is really where the light bulb started to go off. This is a single cell gel using RNPCR, where we add these 30 additional phenotyping markers to the actual reaction. And what you begin to see, instead of the crisp, clear amplicon band that we were getting before, in some instances we would get that. And if you actually looked at the sequencing data, a majority of the sequences were going to the, the phenotyping genes of interest and to the targeted VDJ of interest, with only 1% of the data having what we would call trash. Whereas something that looks like a reasonably good amplification would have 21% of the data as not usable. Whereas something that pretty clearly failed, 89% was not usable. The other hint that we had when we were trying to make all of these different gene markers work together under the same conditions is that you can't design around the actual byproducts of PCR because we went through and we actually sequenced the dimers to see if we could see which pairs are the culprits, which are the bad guys that are actually um, this detriment to the actual signal of interest. And what we found was that one base pair overlap was sufficient for dimerization, which means that it's not, you can't design around one base pair. It's impossible. So you actually have to have physical strategies that can actually remove the dimers during the processing. So this is a, a very aha moment for us on this slide, which is basically we're multiplexing together various targets. And what we found is that we added one target and it removed the amplifier, one primer removed the amplicon of interest. Well, this was kind of an aha moment for us because it wasn't that this was a failed amplification, it was actually a successful amplification. It was just the amplification of the wrong product of the primer dimer product during the PCR. So we developed a strategy called dimer avoided multiplex PCR that uses physical and chemical means throughout the entire process to remove these side products. And by removing these side products, we're then actually capable of getting very crisp, clean signal from single cells. So this is the same single cell experiment that I showed on the previous two slides ago. However, in this case, each of these is a single cell with 30 gene targets. However, in this case, we've tried an entirely different strategy called dimer avoided multiplex PCR, and we can get very crisp and clean signaling. So we realized that the multiplexing capability with this type of technology was limitless. Um, and we decided that we could go after all of the different immune chains in the same reaction, meaning that we weren't stuck to looking at just TCR beta only or just TCR alpha only. We can now look at TCR alpha, beta, delta, gamma, Ig heavy, and kappa and lambda all under the same reaction conditions in a single reaction too. The method also supports unique molecular indexing, so we can actually 
tag each strand of RNA with its own unique tag, label, uh, enabling quantification downstream and, and superior error removal. Um, this extreme multiplexing power allows deep insights into the immune system because now I can look at all different chains at the same time in the sa from the same sample and start to evaluate expression of B cells versus T cells. The one downside to dimer avoided P multiplex PCR is that it is very labor intensive in terms of the processing steps for chemically and physically removing dimers throughout the process. Um, and therefore, we've automated on two different platforms. We have the IR processor, which is an in-house processing system that uh, is based on cassettes, individual cassettes, which I'll show in a few slides. Um, where the reagents are preloaded in cassettes, you just add the sample, put it in, and it will do the entire processing. For larger projects, we use our Biomech I5 so that we can process bulk repertoire in 96 well plates. Okay, so during the validation of this, we wanted to know um, how our strategy was really capturing the immune repertoire. So in order to do that, we actually developed a all-chain synthetic library. So this synthetic library was created by amplifying every single pair of, of amplicons of interest. So say, for instance, the TCR beta repertoire required 50 TCR beta V primers and two C primers. This is just an example we would amplify all different 50 with each of the C primers, so 100 amplification reactions. We did this for every single chain. Then we pulled a small amount of each of those individual libraries together to make a quote unquote synthetic library, which wasn't amplified further, it was just sequenced directly. This library was then diluted to very low concentration and used as, in a, as a template in a reaction. As a control, we used a pair of primers for the adapters. Due to a previous study, we knew that by amplifying using these universal primer binding sites that we've added, we should be able to replicate the library one-to-one -one, or close to one-to-one. -one. Then we did our, uh, our strategy, our dimer-avoided multiplex PCR strategy. And with this strategy, we bind in one cycle and extend using our first primer mix. We clean, we add a second primer mix in which we bind and extend clean again, and then we amplify using a pair of primers. So the entire exponential phase of amplification is purely for the communal adapters. So when we get the results back, we can compare everything to our synthetic library. So that synthetic library is just a directly sequenced fake immune repertoire library. And then it's been diluted and reamplified using our two strategies. So on the repeatability, we can compare our synthetic library, which has no amplification, to our control amplification, which is just the pair of adapters on the outside, and we get great repeatability. On the V gene usage, looking at just the TCR beta gene versus the control, the synthetic library, it replicates very well. And over on the right, we show what's called the V usage ratio plot, which is a log-based plot in which each of the V genes is, is shown with respect to the ratio of the synthetic library. And as you can see, the closer to one, this line, theoretically, one would be no bias in the amplification. When we do the DAM PCR method, where we're doing this binding and extension step with cleaning up and binding and extension with cleaning in a second cycle with the exponential phase of amplification with the pair of primers, we actually replicate the synthetic library very well again. We get a similar trend in the repeatability. The V usage looks as it should, meaning we replicate the repertoire as it was in the synthetic library with very little bias on the various V gene usages. So next, we began to combine chains together. So we started to look at the TCR, what we call four chain TCR, looking at alpha, beta, delta, gamma of four different individuals. On the left here are different um, uh, these are our different uh, ratios of the various chains, alpha, beta, delta, and gamma, from one individual, or four different individuals. And this is zoomed in on one individual to show the repeatability down to even the low-frequency clones. And as you can see, it's got very good repeatability. 
Our repertoire is known for our, our tree maps, which are over on the right. What these tree maps show is uh, individual clonotypes are each individual square. And the size of that square is the relative expression of that clonotype within the data set. So now instead of just having one chain to display, we now have four chains, alpha, beta, delta, and gamma. So you can actually see on one of these individuals, there was an expansion on IR91 on the alpha chain with respect to the beta chain, which was in red. And this was very interesting, but now we have a whole sleuth of immunological tools available to us. So what we were able to do is take that patient single cell and actually go and check to see whether there was something interesting about the alpha cells. And what we found is that there was a clonal expansion of various dual alpha cells within that person's um, blood, and it matched on the single cell level. We also had a really interesting delta gamma expression in IR89. Uh, we were able to go to single cell and show that there was also a clonal expansion of delta gamma cells that had a high amount of RNA in them, and they were the same clone. So the actual single cell began to inform the bulk repertoire and vice versa. The bulk repertoire began to inform the single cell experiments. We also, so we knew one of the best places to apply this technology is when sample is limited or damaged. Um, formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissue is notorious in terms of RNA integrity. Um, it has really poor integrity and you don't often get a lot of RNA because the samples have been sitting for maybe years. Um, so we applied this seven chain where we co-amplify alpha, beta, delta, gamma in order to get insight into that FSPE sample and not use all of it. So we're able to co-amplify and look at the clonotypes of not just the B cells, but also the T cells within that FFPE section. So you may be asking, how would you gain access to the technology? Um, you can gain access to the products and services offered through iRepertoire. And I'll very briefly go over those. Um, so we have product services and automation. Definitely our services are probably our most popular. Single cell is only offered through a service. Um, but in order to enable our single cell, we offer all the way from cell staining to single cell plating um, for the purposes of iPair. We have two types of iPair, TCR and BCR in human, and uh, in mouse we offer TCR. We also offer human and mouse iPair Plus is where we're phenotyping. On the bulk repertoire sequencing, in order to enable the possibility of doing bulk repertoire. There are certain labs that aren't set up to do actually RNA extraction. So we can actually perform the RNA extraction for you. Um, and we can access the ARM PCR through our amp to seq services, our DAM PCR technology with that multi-chain analysis and unique molecular identifiers through our IR Harmony. Um, we've also performed phage display library sequencing for various people and other custom NGS assays. So if you have a question, you know, please reach out to us. We're more than happy to work with you um, to figure out the best solution for your projects. If you prefer to perform some of these things in-house, we do have bulk primer mixes. Uh, we have easy to use kits called IR profile kits that come with all of the reagents necessary to amplify your own immune repertoire. And then to enable single cell plating at your site, we have an eye capture kit that we can send out to you. Um, on the IR uh, automation portion, we have the IR Harmony system or the IR Flex processor system, which enables you to add cassettes into a processing system that's like a miniature liquid handler. Those cassettes come preloaded with all the reagents necessary. You just add your template, you stick it in the instrument. The instrument does all of the steps, reverse transcription, PCR1, PCR1 selection, PCR2, and final library cleanup with the beads. And you just go and retrieve the library, pull them together, and go on for sequencing. So this is a picture of the IR processor where we've automated bulk repertoire. The sample is added to this cassette, which is preloaded at the bottom with the reagents. It has a pipette tip in here that can actually move reagents back and forth. And in this instrument, we actually, it's like a PCR machine that also has liquid handling capabilities. It, it moves the pipette tip around based on a script that's preloaded. It performs PCR1, um, PCR2, and final library cleanup within that.
All of our products and services come with data analysis. So for bulk repertoire, we have a viewing service through, it's called IRWeb. It's accessible through the website. You get a username and login. Um, you get BDJC mapping, identification of CDR3s and CDR3 algebras so that you can compare across different samples. Um, in addition to normal distributions that are provided for immune repertoire sequencing, such as in addition CDR3 lengths, BJ nibbling, and BJ usage. And as I mentioned before, we also have the iPair analyzer, which allows you to build a table of interesting sequences so that you can go on to do cloning and expression together with TISNI plots and frequency maps if you've added plus primer sets to your project. So in conclusion, it's important to note that paired receptor information from physically paired single cells provides actionable information that can be quickly screened. That information can be lost if you just do bulk repertoire, but if you sometimes combine the two, it gives you the information so that you can actually go and make functional proteins that you can test um, your hypothesis. Um, at the single cell level, clonal expansion is evident and important. We saw that in the malaria study where various B cells had expanded and those are the ones that actually bound and cleared the plasmodium falciparum. Uh, we're planning on increasing both our human and mouse single cell offerings to include our gamma-delta pairing and also we're increasing or expanding our oligo-DT-based phenotyping panels. So, and based on what we've learned from the single cell, um, it, it allowed us to develop a new type of technology, a new type of technique that allows us to look at all of these immune receptor chains in a single reaction um, so that one template can be added or a small amount of template can be added, yet still get actionable information. And finally, our high throughput single cell pairing service is going to be available soon, so please check back with us frequently. We're very excited about that. Um, we're located in Cummings Research Park in beautiful uh, Huntsville, Alabama at the Hudson Alpha Institute for Biotechnology Research Campus. Yes, that is a DNA helix. We are probably the only people in the world who have a 1.4 mile double helix walkway. Um, we're now located, our repertoire, at the new Paul Probe Center, which was finished last October and we have expanded quite dramatically. So special thank you to Beckman Coulter again, and thank you to the team at iRepertoire and NIAID. None of this research would be possible without all of the people um, who supported us throughout the years. So thank you all. Thank you, Miranda, for your informative presentation. We will now start the Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. Let's get started. All right, our first question is, do you ever see dual alpha TCR single cells in your data? And if so, what is the frequency? Okay, wow, that's a great question. So yes, we do see dual alpha TCR single cells. Actually, we've seen all different types of combination. I've seen dual beta with one alpha. I've seen dual alpha only. I've seen dual alpha with one beta. Um, so yes, at the single cell level, you can really get a deeper insight into what's happening on the T cell, which could be masked by bulk repertoire. Um, the frequency portion of that question is very difficult to answer because it seems to be an individual to individual uh, kind of difference. So when we did that high throughput pairing experiment, one of the things that we looked at is we looked side by side at the single cell I pair data for that same individual. And um, I didn't show the data set there, but there's actually a population of cells that look like they're TCR beta only, and they were look like there was a population that were TCR alpha only. And indeed, when we looked at the single set and we, cell set and we calculated how many single cells were dual alpha, and that particular individual was 20% dual alpha, but actually dual beta with no alpha was approximately 10%, which actually matched the high throughput pairing data. Um, yeah, so it's a very interesting topic, but we definitely see dual alpha cells. It's just the frequency can vary person to person or cell type to cell type. Great, thank you. Okay, your next question. 
When you look at single cell alpha beta T cells, do you also see clonal expansion as you did for the malaria study? Yes, absolutely. Um, so particularly when the cells, like just as in the malarial study, in the malaria study, they tetramer sorted, positive sorted the single cells from the B cell. Um, if the T cells are tetramer positive uh, or some antigen specific pull down of the TCRs, we definitely begin to see clonal expansion within those populations. Sometimes it can be as high as 100% of the clone B1 clonotype, but each be an individual cell. Um, it, but it varies. Like I've seen as few as five of the same TCR or two of the same TCR and various different clones that have um, that you can directly count the alpha beta of that particular pair to as high as, like I said before, 100% of the clones being the same type. Thank you. What is the minimum amount of cells you require for single cell analysis? So this really depends on how you're submitting the cells or the project to us. Um, as I mentioned before, in Camilla's case, she had 50, actually in one patient, she had 25 of these antigen-specific memory B cells. So in those cases, it really depends on your sorting facility. If you can sort at your site, then you can do as few as half of a plate for submission. That's our minimal submission amount, which I guess would be 48. Um, so if you're submitting to us, we request a thousand cells minimum, um, but we can certainly go over all of those details. If you please reach out to us at info at irepertoire.com, we'll be happy to help you set up a project and discuss this further. Thank you. All right, it looks like we have time for one more question. Is single cell an option for FFPE samples? Okay, so um, FFPE samples are very degraded, usually in the RNA. Um, so this is not something that we have tested, and I'm not sure if it's going to be feasible or not. It's something that we're interested in trying, but we have not tested that yet. Thank you again, Miranda, for your time today and your important research. We would also like to thank Labroot and our sponsor, Beckman Coulter, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. Labroots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's event. Until next time, goodbye.